versus Theodore Edgecombe, 20 CF 3535. Appearances. Grace Unit for the State. Morning, Your Honor. Theodore Edgecombe appearing in person with Anika Ahmad. Diabi Lamar. All right, we discussed a number of things at the end of the day yesterday. Hopefully, the defense witnesses are ready. Who's the next defense witness? Judge, the uh, defense would call toxicologist Sarah Scheiber. Fine, you can ever put on a stand. I'm going to bring the jury in. Um, based on what I was told yesterday, there's going to be two or three witnesses, and then presumably the defendant. I expect the defense testimony to close clearly and certainly this morning, and then we'll discuss if there's any rebuttal, we'll discuss jury instructions, and I anticipate closings this afternoon. Let's have the witness brought in, please. She can be on the stand before the jury gets in, please. Jerry's back. Morning, everybody. I see some of you got the coffee. You're welcome. Um, we're going to continue with testimony. Uh, the defense next witness is on the stand. Ma'am, if you can stand, raise your right hand, please. You swear the testimony given this matter will be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth. So help me back. Please be seated. State your full name, spelling first and last for the record. Good morning. My name is Sarah Schreiber, first name S-A-R-A, -A, last name Schreiber, S-C-H-R-E-I-B-E-R. -E Go ahead. All right. Thank you, Judge. Good morning, Ms. Schreiber. Good morning. Um, can you tell us how you are employed? I am the Forensic Technical Director of the Toxicology Laboratory at the Medical Examiner's Office here in Milwaukee County. Okay. And how long have you had that position for? Since May of 2013. Okay. So maybe seven or eight years? Correct. And what are your responsibilities in that position? In this position, I oversee the daily operations of the toxicology lab, from training to maintenance of instruments to data analysis, um, data review and report writing, and then, of course, testimony for court when necessary. OK. And are you a supervisor of any kind? Yes, I am. OK. And who works under you? Um, there are several employees. Um, one is um, Juan Lazama, another is Chelsea Johnson, another is... Slow down so, so just a bit, and if you could spell the name if you know it, that'd be great, please. One employee is Juan Lazama, J-U-A-N-L-E-Z-A-M-A. -E another, Chelsea Johnson, C-H-E-L-S-E-A-J-O-H-N-S-O-N. Thanks. Greg Wallace, G-R-E-G-W-A-L-L-A-C-E. -L -L Jessica Haley, J. E S S I C A H A L E Y. Okay, and then in and your I'm sorry, there's one more, Brian Adamson, B R I A N A D A M S O N. Okay, thank you. You're so, in your role doing some supervisory tasks, what specifically, uh, in relation to some of the employees, such as you mentioned Juan Lazama, what is your role interacting with him? I supervise him, so all daily activities that he performs, um, from data analysis to his data review, I provide all the peer review for the data that's generated in our office and report those results um, in the laboratory uh, toxicology report that's then shared with the pathologist for each of these cases. So I oversee all aspects of Juan's daily performance. Okay. So with regard to the Office of the Chief Medical Examiner, um, that office conducts autopsies, is that correct? Correct. What are some of the other tasks, tasks that, or responsibilities that office has, to your, best to your knowledge? Well, there's various employees within the office um, that have different job descriptions, job, job duties, um, from medical investigators that will go to the scene and take calls, um, obtain records, help with death investigations from that perspective. There's administrative individuals that deal with administrative tasks um, related to budgeting, staffing, um, administrative rules and procedures. 
Um, the pathologists are there to conduct the autopsies and provide um, opinion about cause and manner of death in each of those death investigations. Um, and then the laboratory is another aspect of the, of the office that is there to analyze the biological specimens that are obtained from autopsy or from the hospital um, pursuant to the death investigations that we are conducting. Okay, so now you mentioned biological specimens. Is blood one of the specimens that you may test as part of an autopsy specimen? Yes. Okay, and do you test the blood for controlled substances or alcohol? Yes. Okay, and in your practice and in your uh, responsibilities and the performance of your duties, are toxicology reports generated that summarize what the contents of a blood specimen would be? Yes, a report of toxicology findings is produced at the completion of the toxicology analysis and that's shared with the pathologist. So that's a summary of all the findings uh, from that analysis. Okay, are you familiar with the case involving uh, the autopsy of Jason T. Clearman? Yes. Okay, and I'm gonna show you what's marked as exhibit D12. Tell us if you recognize that document. Yes, I do. Okay, can you tell us what that is? This appears to be a copy of a toxicology lab report for case number 20-06640 with the name of Jason Tri Clearman. The report date is October the 2nd, 2020. This report was authored by me as evident by my signature, electronic signature on the second page of the report and the date of October 2nd, 2020. Okay, is that a fair and accurate representation of your actual report? Yes, it is. Okay. This time I'd like to move D12 into evidence, Judge. Any objection? No. Fine, received. Now, could you tell us, uh, Ms. Schreiber, what the BAC was of Mr. Clearman that was analyzed? The ethanol concentration in the blood was 0 0.121 grams per 100 milliliters. Okay. And now I'm gonna show you what's marked as exhibit D17. recognize this document not specifically no okay well are you familiar with as a toxicologist are you familiar with dissipation rates and elimination rates of alcohol in human blood yes I am Okay, can you give us a general overview of that concept of dissipation? When any substance is consumed in the body, it's the body's responsibility to remove that substance. This happens in various ways. When anything is consumed in the human body, it is the responsibility of the body to remove that substance from it. This happens in various ways. In speaking about ethanol consumption, depending upon or independent of route of administration, the body will work to eliminate that alcohol from the body. This happens over a period of time, and the alcohol concentration is primarily eliminated through the urine. Okay, and are you familiar, so you're familiar with dissipation rates, what about absorption of alcohol? The body, the human body will absorb alcohol over the time period that it is consumed and will be absorbed into the blood and it will then be eliminated from the, from the body in that same fashion through the urine. Okay, now in your knowledge and experience as a toxicologist, do you understand what the, <clears throat> excuse me, what the relation between the number of drinks someone may consume and their weight is? Yes. Okay, what is basically the relation between those two um, sets of data, let's say it that way. So studies have been done in, in an effort to correlate the concentration or the number of drinks um, based on the concentration of eth ethanol in those drinks 
um, and factoring in an individual's weight to determine their, what um, theoretically their blood alcohol concentration could be based on those two pieces of data. Okay, so are you familiar with, generally speaking, you know, the average person, um, if they were to consume one alcoholic beverage, let's say one beer, what sort of BAC would they be looking at on average? It would depend on the size of the individual. All right, so let's say hypothetically that individual is 250 pounds. Could you tell us what kind of BAC range they would be if they had consumed one drink? It would be a low concentration, probably less than 0 0.01, um, definitely less than 0 0.02 based on that weight. And what about three or four drinks? I'd have to reference a, a chart in order to do that. There's many things that go into that kind of assessment and calculation, um, assuming not only the size of the individual, but the amount of time that elapses during that consumption period, as well as the composition, the alcohol concentration of those beverages that are consumed, assuming that it's an oral uh, route of administration. Okay, but you were saying that if you had one drink and you were 250 pounds, you'd probably be under a 0.1? Yes, under a 0.1 for sure. Okay, and so with three or four drinks, um, if they were consumed all at and, and, and. Clarify. Under 0 0.1 or under, under 0 0.01? Those are big, big differences, right? He said 0 0.1, but I think that left the wrong impression with the jury. Right, I meant clarify. 0 0.01, Judge, just to clarify. I would agree. So you would also be under a 0 0.01 with one drink if you were 250, 250 pounds? Yes. Okay. So fair to say, not even factoring elimination or dissipation of alcohol, if you consumed four drinks, as a 250-pound male, you would probably no more than a 0 .04. Would that be fair to say? I believe so. But again, I would prefer to reference a DOT, DOT chart to be able to speak okay. to those kinds of assumptions that have been made out of that research data. Sure. So I'm going to hand you back exhibit um, D17. Is that in front of you? Yes. OK. Now. Doesn't that say Wisconsin Department of Transportation? It does. And can you flip to the second page? Yes. Does that refer to an alcohol chart? Yes. Okay. Now, what is the maximum weight that is shown on that chart, ma'am? For males, 220 pounds. For okay. females, 180 pounds. Now, I'm going to show you a chart that's marked D18. You are familiar somewhat with Department of Transportation charts, right? That, that the, and you said you needed to refer to that chart to maybe refresh your recollection about the relation of drinks to weight when it comes to alcohol dissipation. Is that fair to say? Correct. Okay, I'm going to show you what's marked as Exhibit D18. Do you recognize that document? Not specifically this document. Okay. But it, is, it appears to be a representation. Hang on. I, I don't want you to speculate. You said you don't recognize it. He can ask additional questions. Okay. Well, would you agree or disagree that it appears to be accurate in terms of Wisconsin's standardized blood alcohol chart which is known also as the HINS chart, would it be a fair and accurate, accurate representation of <clears throat> that chart slash table? It does appear to incorporate the same data as Exhibit D17 um, to the limits of the, of the table itself. Okay. Um, and would that comport with your general knowledge and understanding of the relation between body weight 
and the number of drinks consumed. Yes. Okay. So could you tell us for a, well, and one more thing about exhibit D18, what is the maximum weight that is shown um, on that chart? 240 pounds. Okay. So for a 240 pound um, person, How many drinks approximately, according to the chart, would one need to consume to be a 0.12? Between seven and eight drinks, okay. according to this chart. At this time, I'd be asking for, I'd be moving into evidence D17 and D18 as well, Judge. Objection, Your Honor, she's never seen them before. She, uh, dead, uh, sorry, <laughs> judge, she told us that it does comport with her understanding of alcohol charts. She said she was familiar with the Wisconsin Department of Transportation charts, and she's confirmed that it's an accurate. Actually, she stated she'd never seen that chart before and did say that it said Department of Transportation at the bottom. She actually never said, said she right, saw right. it. She said she's not seen them before. For, for right now, they're not admitted. We can discuss that later outside the presence of the jury. Let's continue. Okay, so just to be clear, uh, it would be between seven and eight drinks for a 240 pound male um, if the BAC was 0 0.12. Yes. 0 0.12. Okay, I have nothing further then, thank you. Cross. Ma'am, this is an estimate, is that correct? Correct. So, just to be very clear, what everything you've just testified to is purely based on estimates about weights and alcohol levels, is that correct? Correct. Does it take into account the alcohol level of the drink? For example, let me put it this way. Miller Lite doesn't have as much alcohol in it as, let's say, a German beer, correct? Correct. Does it take that into account? It takes it into account from the perspective that a drink is defined as one 12 ounce, generally light beer, a four to five percent alcohol by concentration, a glass of wine that's four ounces, or a shot of liqueur of a, some sort of spirit at one ounce of 100 proof. All of those things are considered the same one drink in this calculation. So again, if someone's saying they had four beers, you are referring to a single 12 ounce American light beer. Is that correct. correct? Um, and if they're drinking something that doesn't fit into a single 12 ounce American light beer, this chart would not accurately reflect what's going on in the box. Is that correct? Correct. Um, does, as a matter of fact, when you look at anything on this, it, the, the, all the warnings say this doesn't take into account how different people absorb alcohol. Isn't that correct? Correct. So a, a person who's 250 pounds could have a lower or higher BAC based on the individual way in which they handle alcohol. Is that correct? Correct. Um, it doesn't take into account whether or not they've eaten or not eaten. Is that correct? Correct. It doesn't take into account other environmental factors that could be going on. Is that correct? Correct. Uh, I think I even read somewhere it doesn't even take into account possibly their, their mood or, or whether or not they're agitated or not. Is that correct? Correct. Okay. So, not knowing any of those things, whether or not they're having a good time, a bad time, any of that, this chart really is just kind of a guide. Is that correct? That's correct. And as a toxicologist, you wouldn't recommend somebody to pull out this chart to figure out whether or not they were safe to drive, would you? No. Under no circumstances? No. And to sit there and try to therefore determine, based on a BAC, what someone may have done earlier, this is insane just to use some chart, right? There's too many variables to judge. On what grounds? You said there's too many variables? Hang on, hang on. On what grounds? Hey, what's the relevance of the question? Insane to use a chart? For it, it's hyperbole, but overruled. You can answer. I'll rephrase the question. Fine. It would not be accurate to be able for you to tell us exactly how many drinks someone had, even in a range, just based on a chart and what we're seeing. Is that correct? Correct. There's too many variables. Is that correct? Correct. And so if somebody is attempting to sit there and say, you know, this is the number of drinks based on a weight at autopsy, without anything else, just based on that chart, it's kind of misleading, isn't it? Yes, you have to make many assumptions when you deal with the data 
and extrapolate the data from a chart like this, and not all of those have been defined or verified. Also, I, and I just want, you still have those two exhibits up there? And, and I was looking at this. When we see here at Defense 18, what's the time period that they have here in their example on calculating that BAC? The example is listed as a 180 pound man consuming eight drinks in four hours. So this is a chart that's taking into account four hours? The chart does not take into account time. Okay. It's trying to help you assess the factor of time when using this chart. The, the chart itself assumes zero um, amount of elimination. But in fact, elimination does happen from the time you begin consuming. And, and, and there's another good point. When you were, when the defense counsel was asking you questions, he said, if you are, let's say, a 250 pound man and you have one drink, you'd be under 0.01. Is that correct? I, yeah, I said between 0 .0, under 0.01 to maybe under 0.02. You, you did, and then defense yes. counsel tried to get you to say under a 0.01. Correct. Um, the chart actually doesn't support that, does it? 240 pounds is listed at one drink, 0 0.016. Sorry, ma'am. 240. <laughs> A 240-pound male is listed at one drink peak 0 0.16, 0 0.016 grams per 100 milliliters. Ma'am, based on the toxicology report, you can tell us the victim had a 0 0.012 blood alcohol level. Correct? That's correct. Can't tell us what he drank? Objection. That's a miss characterization it was a point one two. Oh, sorry you're right we're both getting it wrong point one two. Point one two. yeah i put that zero in the wrong part he had a point one two, right the calculated blood alcohol concentration is zero point one two one grams per 100 milliliters and uh can't tell us what he drank correct can't tell us how long he was drinking no the only thing i can tell you is that alcohol ethanol particular was consumed and Anything else that we just talked about, other than what his BAC was found in his body, is really just a guess, is it? The alcohol concentration is not a guess. That's a measured level. No, not that. I'm saying other than the BAC, anything else, how many drinks, what he was drinking, whether or not he even liked it, that's all just a guess, right? Correct. All right, thank you. Nothing else. Thanks. Can we have evidence control on the... Uh Projector device, please. What are you showing now? Just to clarify, the BAC in this case was 0 0.12. Is that correct? If you slide the exhibit over, you can sure. show the, ex the specimen associated. Correct. Iliac blood, um, with, that's our um, identification <laughs> number for that specimen, 8818418. We identified ethanol at a concentration of 0 0.121 grams per 100 milliliter or grams per deciliter, those are the same units, in that sample. And then the vitreous concentration is identified below that. Okay, so as you said on cross, Ms. Schreiber, um, those charts and those calculations serve as a guide, right? Correct. So they kind of give an estimate of how much alcohol one would have had to consume to be at a certain BAC with a given specified weight. Is that right? And assumed specified parameters, yes, that's correct. Those parameters kind of just give the public an understanding of what the average is. Is that fair to say? No. Okay, could you explain that? The parameters, the assumptions that are made when using that chart are that the individual consumed under an empty stomach, that there was no disease states that affected that alcohol um, absorption or elimination, that no time is calculated within that concentration, um, and like I said, alcohol elimination begins at the time that alcohol is consumed. Um, it doesn't take into account non-traditional drinks. It only has limited parameters based on a d the definition of drink that was given previously. Okay, so you said the assumption is that alcohol elimination occurs once alcohol is consumed. Is that correct? Yes. So if someone was a 0.12 BAC a couple hours after they had consumed, 
wouldn't it be fair to say they were even higher than that BAC of 0.12? Provided they're on the elimination side of the curve, yes, their alcohol level, the alcohol concentration would be higher at a previous point in time. Okay. And what is the average elimination rate of alcohol per hour? There are several published rates. Average is 0 0.015 grams per 100 milliliters per hour. But average ranges are somewhere between 0 0.01 and 0 0.025 grams per 100 milliliters <clears throat> excuse me, per hour. That encompasses a larger portion of the population in order to cover any of those circumstances that I spoke of before. Okay. And as somebody is of a higher weight, isn't it fair to say that the number of drinks that they have to reach a higher level of alcohol, um, more is required for that? That's correct. So if you're lighter, then if you have four drinks, compared to somebody that's much heavier than you, you're going to have a higher BAC more it's um, in relation to them most likely. Would that Correct. be fair to say? Yes. So the number of drinks to reach a BAC, um, how would you say that is just in relation to weight, like in terms of the, the correlation there? Is it very strongly associated? I don't understand your question. Let me, let me rephrase that. So if somebody was, let's say, half the weight of 250 pounds. Let's say they're 125 pounds. Section on irrelevance. Sustained. OK, now you mentioned also this chart assumes uh, certain kinds of drinks, um, such as you know one drink equals either 12 ounces of 100 proof whiskey um, or 12 ounces of a light hey, beer. Hey, hey, hey. So again, I think you misspoke. You said 12 ounces of 100 proof whiskey. 12 ounces of 100 proof whiskey, even if you're from Wisconsin, is a lot. That is a lot, Judge. Um, OK, well, why don't we just back up and have you tell us, what are some of the, the, the drinks that fall under the, under the definition of one drink within this chart? Again, one drink is defined as one 12 ounce light beer four ounces of wine, or one ounce of 100 proof liqueur. OK, what about dark beer? Is that of generally known to be of a higher concentration of alcohol? Generally speaking, yes. And to your knowledge, does beer come in greater servings than 12 ounces? Yes, it does. What are some of the other quantities of ounces of Objection, beer Objection, Your Honor. Relevance as to whether or not there's uh, beer. Uh, it's irrelevant. We live in Wisconsin. Beer comes in bigger servings than 12 ounces, yes. Okay. 16 ounces, 24 ounces, a big, huge boot if you're at the Bavarian Inn, it comes in in larger servings. That's in the common knowledge of the jury. All right. Let's move Fine. on. Moving on. So if somebody had a dark beer and they had three to four beers um, of that, Let me scratch that. So the, the three to four drinks that somebody can consume, the typical serving under this chart is assuming 12 ounces of a standard beer. Um, and that, under this chart, you would need seven or eight drinks if you were 240 pounds or to, to reach 0 0.12. Is that correct? That's correct. Again, not taking account for elimination or any of the other parameters that were spoken of previously. OK. Thank you. Nothing further. State. I'm not going to get into all of that. There's just one thing I want to clarify. Defense counsel stated, well, if someone was at a 0 0.12 and several hours earlier um, had stopped drinking, that could cause them to be higher, right? The concentration of ethanol could be higher than it was at the measured time, but not infinitely. At some point, it would be lower because that number doesn't just forever increase in a retrospective fashion. Also, 
if, as in this case, we're not talking about hours between someone leaving the bar and the autopsy, if someone is at a bar drinking, leaves, gets into a car, and within minutes gets out and is shot in the head, that BAC is pretty much where it would have been. Is that correct? Where what would have been? Where his BAC would have been at the time that he got shot and killed. Correct? Yes. Okay. No, no, no. Thank you. Great. All right. You can step down, ma'am. Thank you. Who's the defense next witness? We are recalling Dr. Kelly. Fine. Is he ready? Yes. Based on our conversations yesterday, I expect this to be brief. Philip Kelly, P H I L I P K E L L E Y. Go ahead. Thank you, Judge. And thanks for coming back, Dr. Kelly. Just had a couple questions for you. Just wanted to clear some things up. Um, are you familiar with what's known as the Hinge chart? Objection, Your Honor. We've already taken testimony on this. This is cumulative. Mr. Huebner. Use the mic, please. Sorry. Let me get back. This is cumulative. We've already just gone through this. Judge, I just want him to answer. He, he can answer that question, yes. Can you rephrase it? I didn't hear it. Everybody needs to use the microphones, please. Sir, are you familiar with the HINS chart? Um, I, I'm familiar with, I, I think, what you're talking about as a HINS chart. I just know it as a blood alcohol concentration estimation chart. Okay. I'm going to show you what's marked as Exhibit D18. Dr. Kelly, do you recognize this document? Objection, Your Honor. We've just gone through this. We're literally just going through the same thing again with another witness. Right. Also, where are we going with this? Is this the exact same exhibit that was shown to the last witness? Right, but it is. But, Judge, he's saying that he's familiar with those things. I'm asking to him to confirm if that comports with his knowledge of that. What's the relevance? We've already gotten in it. Number one, this is automatically admissible under Wisconsin law. Yeah, I don't want to talk about admissibility. Uh, I think the objection was cumulative. If we just heard one witness expound on alcohol and BAC and all those things, why do we need this I, witness to do that? I'm not going to have him go into that. I just want to be able to see if he recognizes the chart and show that. Fine, he can answer if he recognizes the chart, then let's ask questions that are not cumulative. Or repetitive. I, I do recognize the chart. Okay. And is that consistent with what your uh, knowledge of the blood alcohol chart in this state is? Uh, I, I, I don't understand the question. The, the blood alcohol oh. chart in this state. Sorry, I will rephrase the question. You said you recognize the chart. Can you tell us uh, what you recognize about it, doctor? Well, the, the state of Wisconsin created this this chart a long time ago to assist people in estimating what their estimated blood alcohol concentration would be uh, based on how many drinks. I think the idea was that you, if you're out and you're drinking, you look up your the chart for your sex, you look up your weight. All right, you look at.
All right, go ahead, Council. A couple okay. questions. All right, now, Dr. Kelly, uh, sorry for the interruption. Could you restart and just tell us what you were saying about the blood alcohol chart in this state? The, the, the chart is just uh, gives an estimate that you can use to estimate what your possible blood alcohol concentration would be based on how many drinks, how many standard drinks that you had. And that chart doesn't assume any sort of elimination, is that correct? The, the chart, well, the chart assumes a lot of things. Um, it, uh, it assumes you're on an empty stomach. It assumes that you're, you're ingesting standard drinks. Um, it, it assumes that uh, you, you start eliminating, actually, you start eliminating metabolizing alcohol right away. So it assumes all those things, and what you're supposed to do is you're supposed to subtract the amount of time since you began drinking and subtract that from the blood alcohol concentration in the chart to get an even more estimated uh, blood alcohol concentration. Okay, and showing you D18, here, could you tell us, not even factoring, um, I'm going to zoom out a little bit. OK, could you tell us, according to the chart, sir, not even assuming the subtraction you were talking about, a 250 pound male with a 0.12 BAC, approximately how many drinks would need to be consumed to reach that BAC? I, I don't know if I can calculate that. This chart goes up to 240 pounds to begin with. Okay, so let's just say 240 pounds then. Um, according to this chart, the estimate around point. One two five is eight. It looks like eight. Okay. So, are you specifically referring to right around here? Yeah, yeah somewhere. Right. That's there. that's the number. And if you go up, I think it's eight. And that that is for two hundred forty pounds, not two hundred fifty pounds. And then that's correct. Okay. And that also doesn't factor for any sort of elimination over a period of time. Uh, that doesn't take into account time. Okay. Now, Judge, at this time, I'd like to move D18 into evidence. Any objection? No. All right. Okay. Thank you. Received. Now, one last question for you, Dr. Kelly. So, last week you were telling us about, you know, your role as a medical examiner here at the office of the chief medical examiner and that you routinely perform autopsies, is that correct? Yes, that's correct. Okay, and as part of your work in being a medical examiner, you're familiar with bodies um, of individuals that come in and um, are deceased, is that fair to say? Yes. So you're very well familiar, would it be fair to say, of death and the natural physiological um, process of death in the body? Yes. Would you be familiar with what happens to a body um, once? Well, let me just ask you to explain. So how do you determine when a body, or sorry, a person has died? Uh, well, our investigators confirm death at scenes, um, and they do so in a number of ways. Um, you know, certainly uh, the lack of pulse, the lack of respirations, the lack of any response to painful stimulus, the lack of any uh, reflexive response to touching the corneas, things like that. So the medical definition for death, could you give us a little overview of that, or is it more of what you just told us? Confirming death re basically requires indicating that all of those natural responses are absent. Okay, and the natural responses, just to sum up, you said is uh, lack of pulse or lack of breathing. What else? 
uh, any, any lack of any responses, any lack of response to pain, any lack of response to touching the corneas, those are all reflexes that, um, that are absent in a deceased person. Okay, now if somebody has just been um, killed, is there something re in relation to the person's body temperature? I mean, I guess, l let me rephrase. Once death occurs, how long does it take for the body to start losing temperature? Objection on it, relevant. It's relevant in this case, Judge. There was some testimony on it about this subject. Over, you can answer, but again, let's move this along. We discussed these witnesses being short and succinct. You can um, answer. Okay. Um, the uh, body temperature is a subjective. Um, uh, interpretation uh, at, of somebody uh, at the scene or whatever. Um, but the, after you die, basically, you have no more blood pressure, so you're no longer moving warm blood to anywhere. Um, the body surface, the skin surface, is uh, one of the places that can lose lose temperature relatively quickly. So, you know, having the body feeling cool to the surface is not uncommon relatively quickly. Um, you, can, you, can, you can check other areas like in the armpits or in the groin area and there may still be some, some uh, warmth, but most of the time the warmth at that point is going to be in the core of the body. Um, you know, you can, you, you can think of this in terms of that's, that's kind of the body's natural responses to it, it'll lose heat as soon as there's nothing generating heat or moving it to the to the surface of the skin. Within a couple of minutes, though, would there be a significant loss of body temperature? W within a couple of minutes, you you would expect, um, uh, assuming nothing else has happened prior to that, to shunt the blood away from the skin. Um, you would expect there would still be some warmth to the surface of the body to you know t touching their skin with your skin. Okay. Thank you. Nothing further. Cross. Couple of minutes and a body could start going cold. Is that correct? Uh, yes. Judge, that's objection. That's a oh, rule. That's cross examination, and that's exactly what the witness testified to. That's what he said, counsel. Can you tell us how long it's going to pass? No, it, it's going to be very. It's going to be highly relative to the person, the circumstances. Uh, as I said, it's a it's a subjective interpretation of the observer. And, and you're saying subjective, so it also takes into account what that person is feeling when they put their hand on the person's body. Correct. One person may may feel warmth. Another person may feel coolness. And if someone's distraught, maybe that's factoring into it. Um, Objection, judge. What's the relevance of that? Counsel, it's obviously relevant because in this case, I, I don't need to explain it. It's relevant based on the testimony of multiple people. Overruled. Additionally, doctor, you stated that, and I'm, I, I'm not gonna belabor this this much, but you're stating what's causing the temperature to go down is because blood is not getting basically to the body. Is that correct? Yeah, this is, this is just, Physiology. I mean, if um, you know, as soon as you, uh, as soon as you die, your the metabolic furnaces of all the cells in your body shut down. Um, your body is no longer producing heat, and you're no longer pushing that heat throughout all the vessels of your blood uh, of your body. Uh, that includes the skin surface. Um, so, the heat begin. You begin to lose heat, just like every other object. Um, you know, whether it's through radiation with the surface you're laying on or the wind uh, carrying away your heat. Uh, um, there, there's, you know, it's a, a simple concept of just losing heat. And um, this, may, this may sound like a dumb question, um, but if a, if a body is kind of like heading down the stairs, so you've got the kind of the top portion or the, the, the legs are on the top of the stairs and the head is kind of going down towards there with the blood rushing, you know, kind of going towards the, the front of the body, due to gravity. Um, is it possible then that the legs and the, maybe the butt might seem colder than their other areas of the body? I, I don't know if I can answer that. All I can tell you is that 
you know, once the blood pressure um, diminishes. And, you know, keep in mind, this is, this is something that can happen in, in living people. I mean, if you see somebody who's about to pass out and you touch their skin, we'll often note that they're cold and clammy. Um, but they're not dead. They're just, their body is shunting the blood to the, the core of the body to support the body. And if you happen to be bleeding, the body does the same thing, by the way. It, the skin is unimportant, so it's shunting the blood to the brain and the heart and the core of the body. So uh, having somebody who's cool when they're about to pass out or when they're dying is, is, not, is not uncommon. So, so really, what we've just talked about now for a few minutes is when somebody dies, you can't tell us how long it's going to be until their body starts to feel cool to the person that touches them. No, actually, you know, the, the, the temperature of the body is not a reliable uh, um, indicator of the uh, duration or the time of death. Um, another thing, doctor, <clears throat> the victim in this case was shot to the head, basically right above the face. Is that correct? That's correct. And I believe you talked about that this was slightly upward front to back with no real left-right deviation. That's correct. Okay, so it's basically a straight-on shot to the victim's face. Yes. And it goes through his face into his brain, if I'm not correct. That's right. Okay. Is that the sort of wound that you would expect to cause someone to drop instantaneously? Yes, it is. Is this the sort of wound that would cause someone to die instantaneously? Um, if you can even answer that. I mean, defining instantaneously, I mean, it uh, could be seconds. You, you, you might maintain a little bit of heart activity for seconds to a minute, minutes. But when someone takes this wound and they go down, it's pretty much a fatal wound, isn't it? Yes. Someone takes this wound into the brain, they fall down. If you're talking three, four minutes afterwards, they're dead, right? Uh, yes. You know, CPR is not bringing this person back. Uh, not in this case, no. Um, holding your hand over the person's bloody head is not going to bring them back, is it? No. Nothing else. Thank you. Anything else? Just a couple of follow questions. Um, doctor, now you're familiar with some of the natural physiological processes that occur in the body after death. Is it fair to say that? Yes. Can you tell us um, what rigor mortis is? Objection on irrelevance. Sustained. Can you tell us what algor mortis is? Objection on irrelevance. Sustained. As far as when a body comes in, or when a deceased person, that is, comes into the medical examiner's office, is the temperature of the internal body uh, measured at that time? No, it's not. It's not, OK. Well, I, I should qualify that. It would. It, there would be a measurement if there was a concern about hypothermia or hyperthermia, but in general, no, there's not. Okay. Now you said that there would be um, there are some areas of the body where there's circulation, such as I believe you said was an armpit or groin. Those kind of areas retain temperature better in the body. Is that fair to say? After death, that is. There. Not necessarily, but those are areas which you might might see some residual warmth. They're they're not open to the to the air. They're not losing heat. They're you know basically they're protected areas. So and they're close to the core of the body. So you might feel some warmth in those areas. So areas such as the pockets, those areas are as you said protected. Um, they're, well, number one, they're near the core. Would that be fair to say? Like the groin area? A little closer to closer to the core. Yeah. And they're also insulated by clothing? Uh, yes, that's, that's possibly true as well. Okay. And they're, I believe you also referred to they're not at the 
outer extremities of the body? Uh, right, yes. So they're not as open to um, the outside you know, elements or the, or the air. Is that fair to say? Mm, yes. Okay. Is there a normal or approximate rate at which temperature uh, decreases in the body after death? Um, no, there's, there's certainly been a lot of people who have looked into this and there's nothing reliable that can allow you to accurately determine that, that time frame. Okay, but hypothetically, if a body is sitting out in, uh, in an open air and an environment, it would be fair to say that the, the body is going to, um, at some point over time, reach what the room temperature is. Yes, at some point there should be an, basically a reach the temperature of its surrounding environment. Okay, well, it wouldn't get any colder than that, right? Well, it, no, it'll, it'll, again, it'll reach the, the surrounding temperature. Uh, it won't get any colder than the surrounding temperature, no. Okay. And you would agree that the month of September typically tends to be a mild month? Um, yeah, it, it, in, in some cases, yes. I, I, it's hard to answer, yeah, but for the most part, September, you're moving into fall. Okay, all right, thank you, nothing further. State, no, thank you. You can step down, doctor. Thank you. Defense, next witness. The defense calls Mr. Theodore Edgecombe. Yeah. Your Honor, we would ask for a couple minutes, though, uh, to prepare. And we also have some uh, legal issues to deal Fine. with. Fine, we'll take a 10 minute break. I'll send the jury out. You guys can. Have some more coffee, but not too much, so we don't need extra breaks. Um, we'll be back in 10 or 15 minutes. Everybody else is to remain seated and silent. Jury's been excused. We're going to take a short 10 minute recess, then we can discuss. There's a couple of legal issues, then the defendant can take the stand. We're off the record.